Hey everybody, it's Kurtz. Good afternoon. Um, I am getting ready to go live here with our friends Simone Gamble from Oars and Laura Kriegel and Allison Klee from Camp Stomping Ground. Um, so this afternoon we're going to talk a little bit about um, the overturning of Roe versus Wade. Um, and we're going to talk um, about how to support our staff, how to talk with campers, and why this matters to camp. Um, so let me add our friends in and we'll get started. So there's Laura and should be coming in in just a moment here. And then um, Simone is on the road doing camp trainings and I think they're looking for Wi-Fi at the camp <laughs> where they're training at today. So I imagine Simone, oh, there's Simone. Okay, wonderful. Hi, Laura, hi, Clee. Hi, Kurt. Here. Okay, there's Simone. So I think they'll be in in just a minute. We're getting better at this Instagram live thing. So, um, Hi, Simone. Hey. Hi. thanks for being here. Um, you're welcome. I have super shoddy Wi Fi. Can you all hear me? Yeah, your audio seems fine. Your video is a little spotty, but I think <laughs> that's okay. All right. Um, so, I um, first of all wanted to thank the three of you for spending time on your Saturday in this busy season to be here and talk with everybody. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, I'm, I've been reflecting on the decision from yesterday, personally, professionally, everything. Um, and I thought about all the times that um, I've had counselors that have needed abortions during the summer, um, you know, among, among other things, very directly and indirectly, this is very related to camp. Um, so that's, kind of the first um, thing I wanted to ask to the three of you, like, is this relevant to camp? How is it affecting the camps you're working at or working with right now? And, um, you know, why should we be paying attention as camp folks who theoretically don't have a lot to do with Supreme Court decisions, but um, actually maybe we do. So I know it's a big question to start off, but, you know, diving, diving right in. I've actually thought a lot about what Simone says in their training about how as much as we don't want to mimic oppressive systems or as much as we imagine our camp to be a camp bubble, that stuff still seeps in. So I think like on the most basic level, that's what we're up against. Um, we can pretend that that stuff doesn't exist, but regardless, staff and campers are like are going to show up with it <laughs> existing even when they kind of leave the quote unquote real world and come to our camps. Yeah. Yeah, Simone, pop in whenever it makes sense. But I, I think to, to talk more about the camp bubble space, it's, you know, um, one of our directors yesterday made the uh, this like very real speech to staff. And um, we were just about to um, get into like cleaning mode right before we wrap up staff orientation. Yeah. We pulled everybody together and said, you know, one of the blessings of being in a camp bubble for the summer, but also one of the parts that can be hard is that we're pretty disconnected from what's happening in the real world sometimes, right? We have an opportunity to put our phones away, to like really engage with each other. Um, and that means that sometimes news from the outside hits us slower. Um, and so they basically said, some of you may have seen and some of you probably have not seen yet. And so we wanted to like address this as a big group um, and uh, and share it and, and everybody's gonna have a different reaction to it. Um, and then it's from there, it's all about how to like circle around staff to support them um, and figure out like what they need in that moment, which will be different for everybody. Yeah, absolutely. I just want to piggyback off what y'all said. I do a lot of workshops around talking about like this idea of utopia versus microcosm of camp. So sometimes we think camp is separate from the real world or its own little bubble where we can kind of let those problems go. And for me, it's like, not everyone has that luxury um, or that privilege to do that. And so I think this is really, really relevant to camp because um, legislation around abortion affects everyone. Um, and so we need to be able to have that conversation with folks around how it, it affects everyone. Um, secondly, I think if we're thinking about how to create safety in our camps, it means that we have to provide psychological safety and people are scared right now. Like, <laughs> I'm terrified. Um, and how can you focus when you have folks who are terrified for themselves, for people they love, for their communities, and especially those of like single or double or multiple marginalized identities, this hits a little bit, a little bit harder. So I think if we want to provide safety, that means we have to have these conversations 
um, that are made even outside of our camp spaces. So we have folks um, ready to talk about it with their young people because it's not going to be if it comes up, it's going to be when. Um, and I think right. we also have a responsibility to to create um, really cool allies in the space too. Um, this, as we can see, like critical race theory, talking about queerness and gender identities being erased in our classrooms. So honestly, camp is going to become one of the only spaces where we can have some of these really hard, difficult, authentic conversations. And if we lose that, then we lose a really big space. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so all three of you um, talked about kind of the staff teams that are, that are at camp right now. This news is going to hit different people or has hit different people, at different levels of um, intensity. Um, what What is your best advice for camp directors in terms of addressing or um, from like a macro level within the entire staff group and then on a micro level thinking people will have different levels of needs and reactivity or you know impact from um, the news um, what what have you been doing at stomping ground what have you been seeing on the road Simone um, what the heck is best practice in this type of situation I know it's really hard. I don't know if there is a best practice, oh, right? Like we can't I think put page seven. Oh, I think we pull it out first. <laughs> say what? Say again, Simone. Um, who wants to go first? Uh, jump in. I'm ha I'm curious to hear your perspective on it. Well, I was in New York City yesterday, and that's when I first found out. So I'm at a camp now where they're just addressing it. Um, I know that they held space for people to talk about it. I think on a micro level, just holding space for folks to kind of step away and really lean into the conversation is one big way. But on a macro level, I think I've been seeing on like different summer camp pages where people are having the conversation, it's becoming a really divisive topic. So I think on a, a senior leadership level, it's important for you all to have the conversation around where you stand, because it's important for you to know, like, what are your beliefs? What are your views around this? Because that's going to frame how you have conversations with staff. So if you are in alignment with this is this decision that takes away the rights of, of birthing individuals, that's going to show up in how you process with, with folks. So I would say get really clear on where you stand, what your camp stands for, so you're not living in disalignment with what your mission is saying, because you might actually end up doing more harm. Um, so doing a temperature check where you are first before you bring it to the staff. Um, but I could give other tips after stomping ground goes. I think that's brilliant, Simone. That's a, that's a great insight. Um, yeah, I, I guess we can speak from what like actually happened here and then be vulnerable about sharing like things we may maybe want to do differently or could do better. I don't know. Cleve might have some thoughts there. But basically what happened yesterday was we... Um, you know, sort of pulled all of staff together, kind of made the announcement, tried to share um, like the facts of what was happening. I think a few of our staff members were um, like uh, uh, at various levels of like awareness around what the law was and who it might impact. And so trying to do some um, like basic information for folks that might need it in like a way that isn't shame. Full or, or like creating a lot of shame around that because I think um, that has a tendency to create further division um, and that that can be harmful to a camp community. Um, so circling around folks that need a little bit more information and then providing um, individuals on the leadership team who identified themselves as being able to talk with folks who have um, who need more specific things in terms of processing. And we gave some um, concrete examples of what that might look like. So, you know, we said we're, we're about to get into like cleaning mode. We're like maybe two hours away from um, closing staff orientation together. So um, what that looks like, it, it might look different for everybody. And um, some people might want to like get into cleaning mode in like a pretty <laughs> like <laughs> forceful way. You know, some people said, I can't wait to get in the bathhouse and just like scrub that floor with like all my life, you know? Um, and some people needed to take a walk and just like call some, a loved one outside of camp. And we said, all of those things are acceptable. Here are like five people who you can 
um, check in with. Um, and, and one of the things that um, Clee and the rest of my leadership team was um, intent on is making sure that the people that we identified had um, differing identities. So um, a person of color, um, queer individuals, um, so staff could see um, and, and find people that like they were comfortable talking with in whatever way um, if they needed that. I think two other things I want to share about what happened is um, we posted a video of our staff um, screaming on social media that happened like pretty organically as a result. So after that um, circle happened and the director announced what had happened, like Laura just described, um, there was a group of staff who kind of circled around each other. And I don't even know who said it first, but somebody was like, we're going to the lake to, to group scream if anyone wants to come. And like Laura said, some staff walked away to make a call or go process on their own, but a big chunk of staff went. And it was like, Laura and I hadn't made it down there yet. And it was like, it was just one of those unforgettable moments. Laura compared it to the first summer of Stomping Ground in 2015 when same-sex marriage was passed. Um, and they like painted rainbow flags on campus spaces. Um, and it was just like, it was really moving and it echoed throughout all of camp. Um, and I think the takeaway there is like letting staff lead and asking them what they need and kind of trying to make any of that available. Um, something that we've been working on before the court ruling, like unrelated, but now I'm grateful that we have the steps in motion is um, Laura has been emailing back and forth with a therapist about rates for what it could look like to offer sessions for any of our staff who are interested this summer. Um, they would be online telehealth therapy appointments, but um, I'm hoping that that's something that can be worked out, especially after this. Um, but again, wasn't a response, but like, I think something all camp directors should be striving for is how to provide or connect people to mental health services. I completely agree with that. Um, a lot of the things that y'all are doing are things that I would suggest too. And I, I just want to be transparent that I'm not a camp director and I have the luxury of being a consultant that can tap in and out of these spaces. So my suggestions could work or cannot work. So I just want to be transparent about that. Um, but some of the things I would suggest are one, like a healing space. Cause I know mm -hmm. there's a lot of rage, but under that rage could be a lot of sadness and confusion and fear. So like providing a space where folks can come together, sit, heal. And if you're not thinking about like contracting someone to come in to offer that space at some point, um, and then offer both like learning and unlearning space. Because I think for some folks, this is something that they're constantly thinking about, especially if they're a birthing individual. And then sometimes this is something that they've never heard of because it's now it's such a big deal on a big scale. So offering on learning spaces, and that includes in that includes have around how we have the conversation around abortion too. A lot of folks are focusing on like women's bodies and our bodies, our choice, which is true. But a lot of folks are excluding like trans folks or excluding non-binary folks. So even getting language right is really important in this moment too. Um, and also making sure that people are connecting that the rights that are being taken away now are already impacting queer folks and may um, extend to talking about like same-sex marriage and, and so much more. So knowing that this is only the beginning of something. Um, and then also offering like allyship spaces. So are there resources you can give people around like if they wanna donate to abortion funds or mm -hmm. if they wanna do some of the like mutual aid work or um, allyship work, offering that as a resource that they can do on their off time or as a project if your camp is, um, is up for that as well. And then the last two things like think about programming. Is there space where you can kind of include talking about like social justice issues too? because I, I don't think camp should be separate from that. And young people and staff might need that more than ever now because things aren't gonna continue to happen over the summer. So where can that space be put into the structure? Is there a class you can offer? Is there someone who is um, down to offer that? And think about how you can reschedule your programming um, if it hasn't been done so already. And then the last thing I would say is like revisiting your, your sex education, not sex education, your, um, your policies around sex on camp because campers and staff are having um, sex and we need to mm. talk about it. And we should think about how do we add this lens, especially if you live in a state where abortion is gonna be severely restricted. 
what does that mean for your camp staff or your campers who are having sex and you're you're having a policy where you're just saying like don't do it on camp now it has bigger ramifications and bigger implica implications of what that means so revisiting that might be something that's really important too for this summer and future summers um, so Simone started with a segue into kind of my final question here, which is thinking about our campers. Many people are already in session. I know the stamping ground campers come tomorrow. Yeah. Um, <laughs> very fresh yeah. news on people's minds. And a lot of times um, we think, oh, well, this is not a topic for children. You know, you hear people say things like that. And then I read these other examples and it's, you know, a 13 year old and X, Y, or Z state needed to travel this far or gave birth. Or I'm like, oh, okay, they're definitely at my camp. You know, this is um, a lot of, these rulings are about children, you know, and affect children, affect people that are camper age. So um, how are we thinking about, you know, kids that are at our camp right now or coming to camp? What's the best way to respond or engage um, and have, you know, realistic um, conversations with them while still preserving the um, other point of camp, which is to release and escape and run around and, you know, play and have fun right so how can we can we have it both um what makes sense I, I don't know the answer to that question um but I'm curious what you three are thinking in that respect I would love if someone else tapped in first I'm still thinking a little. <laughs> yeah I guess my my first thought as you were talking Kurtz was um you know b definitely bound to come up um in a variety of ways. I think um, mostly kids, I can think of kids being curious and wanting to know more. Um, and I don't know what those conversations look like at home or what topics discussed or not discussed. And like curiosity is like one of our core values being humbly curious is something we talk about all the time at camp. And so trying to figure out a way to help campers, um, be humbly curious in a way that is also respectful to staff, I think is the, is where I'm, my head's getting stuck. Um, I think I, I'm thinking about how we support staff and protect staff from having to have mm. some conversations over and over again, that might be really draining or like emotionally, like exhausting for different people, depending on like who, who you are and where you're coming from and what your um, relationship to this stuff is. And so, how do we um, provide staff the support and then a, a ability for staff to get out of those spaces if it's too, if it's a lot um, and, and giving leadership um, the, the time to address that with, with kids as well as with staff. I think um, there's like a, there's kind of like just a big, like from the top kind of like hug around all of those aspects and paying attention to them all at the same time. And I, I think it's going to, it's going to happen in live time. We'll keep you in the loop. I don't know exactly how it'll play out, but right. yeah, I was, I was kind of saying to Laura that um, I think I tend to think like um, if a, if a staff member came up to me tomorrow and said, Clee, what do I say when my kids are talking about the overturning of Roe v. Wade? Or what if a younger camper asks what abortion is or anything like that? I think that, what I would encourage their language to be is pretty similar to how we talk to our staff team about it, which is um, this is a really big event that just happened and it's going to affect all of us differently. So out of respect for each other and ourselves, identify staff who are willing to have those conversations with campers in a humbly curious way um, and getting their consent to have those conversations um, in order to respect their boundaries and, and protect them um, from what Laura just talked about, any topics or information that may be emotionally charging um, and just being cognizant that everyone's going to come with this um, with a different understanding. So it's important for whoever is consenting to have those conversations to um, stick to the facts and more so be um, open-minded and validating rather than sharing a bias or point of view that wouldn't be fair to someone. Yeah. One, one last thought I have is like, uh, you know, as we're talking, I'm thinking about tra the trainings that we do on, you know, if a kid asks a question about something that feels more, mm -hmm. um, 
sensitive in whatever direction, right? We help staff say, well, let's turn it back, like make the ma make the kid the main character of the story again. And so say, why do you ask? Like, and but you have to do that in like a really specific kind of like wholehearted tone. And it's not a why do you ask? Like, that's like a shameful thing to to be thinking about or to be wondering about. But it's an, it, instead, it's like a let me sit down, let me like make some physical space for you. Let me like look you in the eyes and like share in my tone of voice that I really am curious about why you're asking. Because from there, then we can react appropriately depending on like, you know, maybe it's just something that their friends are talking about. And it's kind of a, a weird joke because we don't know how to process sometimes as kids and, and that's like a defense mechanism. So, or maybe it's like, you know, it's something that is really scary because of a older relative or sibling that you have and how it might be affecting them. And so getting some more context from kids about why they're asking, I think will help inform um, how we answer. Also before S Simone shares, maybe just, I think that we also empower our staff with sensitive issues to say, um, that's a great question and, and validate before shaming, but also sharing like, this is actually something sensitive or personal to me, or this question actually makes me a little bit uncomfortable. Let me find someone on staff who is comfortable having those conversations. Um, so the camper is um, validated and, and also gets space to be followed up with, with someone else who's consented to that. Absolutely. That's a great point, Chris. Perfect. Yeah. Y'all for also um, highlighting the fact that this might be triggering conversations for people. Cause sometimes I'm like, have the conversation, but <laughs> I need to also remind myself of that too. Like not everyone is prepared to, or what triggers that might bring up for folks. So I'm glad that that's mentioned on the call too. Um, for me, I do think there is definitely a need for direct conversation around what it is. Like even doing it in a town hall way, I've seen some camps maybe attempt. Um, they also did that with Juneteenth. That was really helpful. Um, but also I think uh, leadership meeting with staff first so you can get like a um get like a handle on where people's views are not to say like oh you shouldn't definitely be talking about abortion to young people but just like it's important to know where your staff stand because those conversations are going to happen whether we know they are or not so just being really mindful and then having more one-on-one -on -one conversations so you know what's happening in the cabins and then clearly expressing where your camp stands and that you're standing by facts, that you're not standing by like just biased opinions, because um, that'd be really important before you start any of these conversations on camp two. So a direct co conversation, giving out knowledge, articles, resources, and age appropriate ways, I think is important. Um, that can happen in like cabin, cabin specific ways where you're like winding down at night or have like a rest and reading period where they can talk about it or ask questions. And I really like the idea of like just having them be able to ask questions. It doesn't mean that the staff member has to have the answer, but that open space of open dialogue and questions is not always encouraged in other spaces. So I love that. Another thing is that I think what you said, um, Sarah, earlier, is like sometimes camp needs to also be about releasing and having fun. And for me, social justice is fun. <laughs> so we can like mix both. Like I even think of like having okay. folks hear about the decision and then journal about it at night or creating an art project in response to it. Like, what does this um, news, what kind of art do you wanna create in response to this? Or thinking about even in, if you're playing basketball, like having a game where it's six against three and then talking about the Supreme Court setup and like how power <laughs> that's in that way. <laughs> or even thinking about like having a culminating project or a debate um, with your older people around, with older campers around this topic. So there's ways that you can like weave it in um, into some of your projects where you offer space for it, but it doesn't have to become this like, we're going to sit down and talk to you about abortion now. Like you can weave it in in different ways. And it doesn't just have to be about the act of abortion. You could talk about the power. You could talk about the Supreme Court. Um, you can talk about our expansion of womanhood and including trans and non-binary folks. There's so many different angles where you don't just have to talk about that one piece, but it should be mentioned at some point. Cool. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so I'm just curious before we leave, is there anything else that comes to mind that we didn't talk about that anybody wants to share? Um, I just want to reflect back on what Simone said for a minute. I love those concrete examples because I think if staff are feeling overwhelmed with those conversations or maybe there's a camper or a group of campers whose conversation or questions or curiosity is pretty cons uh, persistent, um, 
I like the idea of saying like, what would feel good to you? Here are some ideas. Here are some things we've done in the past in regards to um, historical events or social justice issues. Is it a project that we could create together? Is it a basketball game? Um, I love, I, I hadn't thought about it like that before. So I'm definitely keeping those in my back pocket for the summer. Yeah, those are great ideas. <laughs> Lit my brain on fire for sure, Simone. It's fun to to see how you think about all that kind of stuff. I The last thought I have is like around parents and mm -hmm. having dealt with yeah. some uh, like past frustrations from uh, folks who uh, like, you know, thinking about the PR aspect of this and how it just does whatever we do at camp does seep out into like how we who bring who comes to camp and how they relate to camp and the surrounding areas around where our camps are located or whatever and I think that maybe um, having similar to what you said in the beginning Simone about like getting clear yourself on how you feel and how that relates to your leadership and all that kind of stuff I wonder if um, might be useful for some camp directors thinking about it for us um, like having kind of like thinking through what a response might be like if a parent asks like what are you doing or like why have you decided to you know play three versus six basketball or whatever like I think that um, having kind of a go-to statement to be able to lean on in those moments um, is uh, takes the, the pressure off if it is if it does come to people being frustrated in whatever direction absolutely um, I think my final words, um, I would, I would hope that this moment prepares people for future summers to kind of think about how do we keep social justice as a part of the culture at camp, because there might be frustration from folks, because I was having a conversation with a close friend of mine around like, the rage, and the like wave of response that came in response to this abortion ruling. But then sometimes the the loud silence that happened around like anti-trans legislation or um, I guess other issues that affect like the black community. So even thinking about how we respond, how that might be showing like our priorities into what's important and what we should be addressing and what we shouldn't be. So for me, it's like, how do we make sure that we are mindful of the things that we turn up for and, and center? and how that might be also causing harm and sharing with our staff and campers what is a priority and what is not. So I think that's for like the larger camp community too. How do we make this a part of our culture so we're not just like enraged in response to certain things and leaving out other marginalized communities too. Good point. Good point. Okay, well, um, Simone, Klee, Laura, thank you so much for your time and energy on this conversation. Um, I know the greater camp community appreciates the three of you greatly. And I'm, I want to wish Camp Stomping Ground an awesome, yes. fun, special opening day. You have some very lucky, lucky kids coming mm -hmm. tomorrow. Um, and Simone, very safe travels wherever yeah. you are. Very campy. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad the Wi-Fi held through. Um, and we'll it's post um, on the timeline if people want to revisit or share it with others. Um, and let's let's keep talking, let's keep growing, you know, um, it's not going away. So we'll, uh, gotta, gotta keep, keep on it. So, okay. Everybody have a, have a good Saturday and we'll talk to you soon.